Today's episode of Errata Text is brought to you by By the Same Token and their new Star Wars Unlimited series of reusable tokens. With the Game Genic tokens in short supply, have a look at the tokens that BTST has to offer. Made of a sturdy plastic with etched on lines on both sides, this set includes tokens that cover shields, damage, experience, temporary modifiers, initiative, and epic action tokens that cover the whole box. Never get your arenas confused again with the new ground and space arena markers designed by me! Well, suggested by me. Everything is manufactured in the UK, they are available as a set or piecemeal if you like. Also available are magnetic life trackers with a pair of dials to count health and even some switches to keep track of whether or not your epic actions can still be used, all with a nice, satisfying snap to them. Ooh. Ooh, that's nice. Other games also available, such as Pokemon and Arkham Horror. Use coupon code KODOK5 to save 5% off your order. Links in the description below. So recently, it seems like WizKids Games has listened to the criticisms leveled by me and others at their recent miniatures venture, the competitive dungeon skirmisher Dungeons & Dragons Onslaught, specifically its $140 price tag. The big hanging point being that the box is asking an incredibly high price for what amounts to a basic trial of the game. To compare, an older dungeon skirmisher, Mage Knight Dungeons, also produced by WizKids, had starter sets that cost you $20. They were pretty slick too, including a basic map, some treasure chests, all the other pieces you need to play like dice, and 8 fully painted miniatures. As a starting point to playing Mage Knight, you really couldn't get any better than that. So, the response from WizKids to this criticism? A new Onslaught set with the word accessible right there in its advertising. Like the Mage Knight set, it's a lot slimmer, with eight fully painted miniatures and ditching the fancy folding game board with a set of flippable tiles which are cheaper to produce. So this seems on the level, right? A return to form compared to how they used to do things. So, what's the price? Well, the original set, which came with more than twice as many minis, including a handful of large ones, and a much fancier board, was $140. This new, slimmed down, less than half the size, accessible starter set? Why, it's just a modest, tidy little $100. <sighs> No, WizKids, you do not get to use the word accessible with that price tag. And again, I really have no idea why this is such a struggle. Like I established before, WizKids gained their reputation through affordable miniatures gaming. So I can only assume that Hasbro is charging them an arm and a leg for the Dungeons & Dragons license as a part of their recent Slice Open the Golden Goose policy, an expense that they are passing on to the players. So, I mean, what am I expecting them to do? Take a hit on their profits and sell the set at basically a loss? Well, yes, actually, because the thing a brand new game needs more than anything is to get as many players as possible, even if that comes at the price of immediate profits. Because all of your design, artwork, rules, and components are only half of what makes up your game. The other half is the players. Hello and welcome to Text, the follow-up to the 7 Deadly TCG Sins where we take a look at different elements of game design. So a word I throw around a lot is accessibility. Accessibility in games has several meanings, such as its level of complexity, requirements of language, how much stuff you have to memorize, how many things you need, and those are certainly things to consider, but those I have covered in other videos, such as the ones about reminder text and tutorials. But when I'm talking about accessibility, I am talking about the simple act of just being able to get the pieces needed to play at all. This applies not just to starter product, but other things as well, such as basic components and even some levels of competitive play. Because, and this is important, players are content. We're not playing solitaire here. All of those cards and mechanics and archetypes don't mean anything if nobody's playing it.
One of the biggest problems plaguing the industry, especially at the higher levels, is that the bigwigs who don't even play the games they sell have forgotten the vital role that players play in the success of a game, selling their products as more of an extravagance than as a hobby. No, I would not like to spend $400 on a silly little mat for my children's trading cards, thank you. It turns out that, well, a lot of people feel alienated by games whose products are excessively expensive. It tells them that it is not for them, and they will feel dissuaded from even trying. This is why, in my video about starter decks, I prioritized a clean, inexpensive experience, where the only real frills are those things that can make someone more interested in further exploring a game. I would rather have three decks at $10 than one deck at $30, because then somebody can spend just $10 to get started. It helps to think of this like the cover charge you might pay at a club. I mean, sure, a club with a cover charge of $100 will attract a more refined clientele, but the one that only charges 10 is going to have a heck of a lot more people to party with. It doesn't really matter what you offer, people are going to be looking at that price of entry and react appropriately. It's why I give Onslaught grief over their price tag. That's asking an awful lot for someone to just try out your game. Even Warhammer has a cheaper point of entry, giving players two squads of minis and a leader for each player for less than the cost of a typical standalone unit, letting folks try the game for about $25 a person. Heck, even Heroclix isn't that cheap anymore. Actually, I don't have to complain about Onslaught anymore when WizKids just launched their new Star Trek game that comes with just six miniatures, two of which are dinky little fighters, and costs... <laughs> oh, oh man, I know what your prime directive is. Money! to boldly blow like no game has blown before. Another example is company Mino-like, whose games involve components that are required for play, but are scarce outside of their often pricey starter decks, permitting no other easy pathway in. Buy a deck you didn't like? Can't build a new one out of boosters without buying a new starter deck that you might also not like. It's a weird habit they have, and I can think of several games that bit the dust while using these sorts of silly mechanics. Although now we have Grand Archive and their $50 starter sets giving Splooshy Toad a run for their money, I don't care what else comes with it, I can't get that starter deck without paying the $50. This is inaccessible design. I mean, I've heard people defend these by saying that the only products that should be made are high-priced competitive items. And guess what? That's gatekeeping! The thing every fandom wants to be known for, right? I hope you enjoy having fewer players who buy less cards. Heck, it's why I oppose the idea of including card sleeves with a starter set. The sheer cost of adding them increases that initial buy-in cost for something that only a few people benefit from. Sleeves are better included in the next logical step sort of product I've talked about before. The collector boxes, treasure troves, storage vaults, the thing the player buys after they try. This sort of pricing is what is known as a pain point, a small inconvenience that nevertheless harms an experience to the point that it might make people not want to try it. I'll probably do a video on the subject at some point. Starter products are best made as loss leaders. Their goal should be the onboarding of new players who then play against each other. A loss meant to be taken by the publisher, not the stores, Bushy Road. A cheaper entry product is one that people are more likely to take a chance on, and the best way to get someone into your game is to get your cards into their hands, like I always say. Think of the lower profits as an onboarding cost for new players who, upon trying your game, will then start not only playing with other people, but also buying the more profitable items, such as booster packs. Is this a little underhanded? Maybe, but it's a dog-eat-dog -dog world out there. A confident lead is the way to get ahead amongst all the noise. But speaking of those more profitable products, yeah, it's time to talk about Bonfire. So we've covered the importance of making it easy to get people playing your game at all, but what about the subject of people playing it at a higher level? 
This too is a level of accessibility. Another common complaint I hear about a lot of games is that people feel priced out of being able to play, not due to the initial buy-in, but due to the cost of acquiring the rare cards needed to play competitively. My thoughts on this? It's complicated. Like I detailed in my Rarity Iceberg, important cards with scarce printings I think are fine, but there's a nuance. It should be limited to specialized cards, the capstones of their respective decks or archetypes within a broad and diverse meta around which a community will form to seek out and exchange these cards. For example, Tyranitar EX is a good and important card, but not every deck runs Tyranitar EX, not even every fighting deck, so it's not unreasonable to assume that anybody who pulls a Tyranitar EX is just as likely to keep it as they would be willing to trade it for what they really want. But what if, instead, that high rarity was applied to a card that everybody needed? So Yu-Gi-Oh! has a history. A history of making cards with broad utility into some of the rarest cards available. Something done with the naked intention of selling more packs to make people chase after those cards. In fact, the game has a reputation for using its initial launch in Konami's home country of Japan as a testbed to see which cards are more popular in order to heighten the rarities of those cards for the international release. Now, while this usually affects popular and powerful archetypes, sometimes this creeps into basic utility cards as well. Bonfire is a normal spell card whose effect allows a player to search their deck for a single level 4 or lower pyro monster, pyro being one of the game's basic types akin to fire in games like Pokemon, and adding it to their hand. Yeah, that's all it is. A basic deck search, akin to cards like E Emergency Call and Reinforcement of the Army, cards which basically have the same effect, but for elemental heroes and warriors. When the card first came out, I compared it to the Pokemon card Dive Ball, which lets you search for a water Pokemon and add it to your hand. Dive Ball is an uncommon. E Emergency Call is and always has been printed at common. Reinforcement of the Army is one of the most reprinted cards in all of Yu-Gi-Oh! Basically, if you run a deck with Pyro Monsters, you want this card as badly as any Warrior deck wants Reinforcement of the Army. Bonfire was printed at Super Rare. Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot to mention. Bonfire was printed at Super Rare in Japan. And this seemed to cross a line for even a lot of Japanese players. Because Bonfire wasn't an archetype-defining capstone, it was a utility card for basically any pyro deck. Granted, a pyro deck was top tier at the time, but this is a card that every pyro deck, past, present, and future, would want to run multiple copies of. A card that Konami themselves had deliberately imposed scarcity on. But after seeing the vitriolic response many had given them around putting such a card at high rarity, Konami International did the sensible thing upon release and printed Bonfire at a more reasonable rarity so that more players could enjoy the card. I'm just kidding, they made it an ultra rare. Yes, Konami saw the dust up around Bonfire and decided the best thing to do was print it at the highest rarity that is not premium rare under my iceberg. The result? This basic utility card was printed at such scarcity that its secondary market price is often in excess of $100. These other two are a dollar a piece on a rainy day. I mean, on one hand, the people who are willing to pay that much and thus incentivize Konami to continue their international rarity hikes are certainly part of the problem, but you can understand why this might cause people to feel priced out of playing competitive Yu-Gi-Oh! I mean, if you can't pony up at least $300 or three Onslaught accessible starter sets for a full play set of Bonfire, you can't even begin to make a competitive Pyro deck. Dear God, do not let this be my new standard of measure. This is why I compared it to Dive Ball. My comment was, Pokemon would have printed this at Uncommon, because they did. 
And that's been the case with a lot of Pokemon cards. The archetype capstones are printed at top rarity, but utility cards are either printed at uncommon, or if they are printed at rare, are former uncommons turned into regularly reprinted evergreens, meaning there is no lack of supply on these core utilities. This results in Pokemon being considered the most accessible of the big three, where actual deck construction is a lot more important than acquiring anything but the deck's capstones. Now, there are premium versions of these essential cards, things such as full arts and secret rare treatments, but the only real pressure to get those versions is to show off, which pushes the collectible angle a bit more. As for how these sorts of special treatments can go out of control, and about Magic the Gathering in general, I'm going to pass the baton to Touristic studies. Go watch the glimmer. I mean, just in general, a lot of these big companies can get away with this sort of thing purely because of their size. New games really can't. Your goal is to convince people to leave the big boys, not replicate them. It's a delicate balance. You want people to feel like their collection has real value to it, but you don't want to do so in a way that makes people feel excluded at the basic levels. Scarcity is fine when leveraged for the purpose of ingenuity and community. It crosses a line when it pushes people out of playing. Courting players is something I don't think everybody considers when it comes to rolling out a game. It's important to remember that your player base is as vital a part of your game's content as anything you create, and you must treat them as such. Games who treat players as things to be sold to and exploited have lost the message. And finally, while it is fine to have cards that are scarce, Keeping top utility cards hostage at higher rarities in a way that prevents all but the most affluent of players from playing will slam the veritable door in many players' faces. Keep these things in mind, and you too can make a better card game. Join us next time on Text. And that's another video in the books. I know I took a lot longer to get this one finished than I said I would, but hey, it's out now. It's another one about, you know, the, the sort of things that I think not everybody thinks about when they're making a game, you know, your people who play your game, they are part of the game and part of that experience. So a lot of what you do involves courting the sorts of players that you want to be playing it, generating that sort of environment. Something I guess I didn't really go over were things like community management and all of that, but that's an important thing too. Places where fans can meet and engage with each other, although we have more tools for that than ever before. We of course have our Twitters and our Discords and of course Patreon. And of course, as usual, I want to give a big thanks to all of my Patreon supporters, without you guys, I would not have made it through this, um, all of the things that have been happening here. So again, a big thanks to you. And of course, speaking of, I do have my Twitter and Patreon does have the Discord connected to it, which will give us a, a lot of fun things to do. I am filming this as the eclipse is about to happen. So if the room darkens a little bit, don't be surprised by that. But yeah, it's been a, it's been a fun time. And until next time, this is Kodak signing off. Join us next time on Erratatext.